Hi, welcome to our How to Write Bible Study. So tonight we're going to be in uh, Titus chapter 3 tonight. You know, we, uh, before we get started tonight, one of the things that uh, we always love to do, we always like to come to the Lord and make sure that he blesses our time together. So let's go to the Lord and, and ask him to bless our time together. So Father God, we, we thank you, Lord, um, for your blessings, Father. We thank you for your blessings, Lord, that we see um, each and every day, Father. We, we also thank you, Lord, and we lift up the blessings that we don't see, Father. Many times we walk in this world, Father, and taking many things for granted. And Father, help us, Lord, to, um, to understand and to see you, Lord, working in our lives. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, be with our families. Um, would you, uh, your word, go forth tonight, Lord? Would you um, open up the hearts of people that need to hear your word, not only here, Father, but online, Father. Anybody that stumbles upon this study, Father, may they hear from you tonight, Father. This is our prayer. And we pray all of these things tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So as we've been traveling through um, the pastoral letters, and we were here, we find ourselves in Titus, the very last chapter tonight. Um, and we're going to run our very last chapter of the pastoral letters. And so one of the things, uh, one of the things that's important that uh, we, as we've been studying is we'll kind of go back and we'll kind of uh, go back into chapter 2 and We'll see a couple of things that we hit on um, last week as we studied through chapter 2. Um, but, you know, the pastoral letters as we've been traveling through 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and now here in Titus, um, this is the very last chapter of the pastoral letters. And it's interesting that um, many times as we're going to go through this study tonight, if many times I think that um, the Lord is speaking in our daily lives in things that are going on um, every single day. Um, and I, I think oftentimes I miss those things. And, and it's going to be interesting tonight as we see some of these things tonight. But one of the things in chapter 2 um, that Paul started off strongly there telling Titus in verse 1 of chapter 2, he told him to speak the things that were proper for sound doctrine. Um, and one of the things that we learned uh, last week is the word that used in the Greek, hugiano, in the Greek, um, the word uh, which is, we get the word um, hygiene, right? Hygienic, which we get. And it means a wholesome gospel, a true gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the current, the undercurrent, or the actual theme of the, of the chapters have been um, the, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and so we're going to, as we move forward, we're going to see that tonight. But it's just amazing to see the wholesome gospel and the word of God that uh, Paul is telling Titus. And then he went down of a list of men and women, he went, he started off with the older men. He started telling people individually um, the way that they should walk. Um, the older men, he asked them to be sober, reverent, uh, temperate in love and in patience. Um, one of the things that as we spoke about uh, last week that kind of hit a note with everybody, it seems like uh, men, as we get older, we seem to be get more grumpy, right? We seem to get more grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing that's interesting about Paul um, that he tells Titus that what we should get um, when we get older, that we should get more gentle, more loving, that we should reflect Christ in all things in our walk. And so this was his uh, advice for the older men. Um, he also addressed the older women. Um, he told the older women he had a few list of things. But one of the things that really stood out is not to be slanderers. Uh, and one of the words that we also saw in that was the uh, Greek word diabolos, uh, where we get the word the devil. Um, and it's interesting that, uh, that it's uh, slandering, it be talking um, evil or talking behind someone's back. And so these are one of the things that when we do those things that we are actually doing the work of Satan. Um, and this was, one of the commentators pointed that out, and I thought it was interesting um, that he talks about one of the things that we do as we talk behind people's back is that we actually slander them. And so he uh, really quickly, he actually told the older women to actually um, to be teachers and to teach the younger women. And we remember how to love their husbands and how to love their children. And, and many of we, we talked about this last week that I think many times we think in our lives, well, of course, women, they know how to love their children and they know how to love their husbands. Uh, but what Paul was telling Titus to, to love them with the love of Christ. And, and I think it's important for us, and I think we talked about this last week also, it's important for our children, especially our adult children, when they go down a path that maybe we don't necessarily agree with, um, that we should come alongside and many times just be loving and be, be there um, 
And, and I don't think, like we talked about this last time, that we should always be scolding them or telling them what they're, the way that they're living, that they're living wrong. We need to be patient and we need to be more like the Lord. And we need to say, Lord, um, please give me patience for my children and give them understanding for what I'm trying to convey to them. And I think it's important. Um, and so we saw that, that the uh, older women are, are teaching the younger women. Uh, one of the things, the last things, is the young men, um, that they were to be sober-minded, um, that they would take life seriously, and especially in the Word of God. <laughs> also, he, uh, he addressed uh, Titus, and, and many of you might think, well, he's addressing Titus, he's a pastor, um, so what does that have to do with me? Uh, we are all, as men, we are called to be leaders, uh, spiritual leaders of our, of our houses and of our homes. And this is what uh, he is addressing here, and he also told them that they should be a pattern of good works. And we talked about this last week, that the good works that we're speaking about is not a good work unto salvation. We don't do good works to earn our way to heaven. And, you know, I grew up in a church and it was all about good works. We were trying to earn our way to heaven. Everything we did, we were trying to earn our way. But when we come to understand the grace of God, that he gives us grace, that he pours down and gives us mercy, not giving us what we deserve. It's just such an amazing thing. And so uh, he said that we should be an example um, of good works. And he really briefly touched on the employee, employer. Um, as, as many of you, some we have business owners here tonight. Uh, we talked about the employees uh, not answering back, not pilfering. And we talked a little bit about pilfering, um, taking small items. And, and I talked a little bit about you know, there's people that would take pins and I would see these pins. And a lot of times we think, wow, this country, this company's got million, it's a million dollar company. So what does it matter if I take a few pins or a few, uh, you know, anything that you use small staplers, I've seen people take staplers, other things, um, stationary and stuff like that. But we should, as Christians, as followers and believers of Christ, it's part of our witness um, that we would walk differently than the world, um, that we would walk way differently. And so this is one of the things uh, that Paul is trying to convey to Titus to tell the world. And one of the things also that uh, was interesting, he asked us to adorn the word of God. And we learned the Greek word cosmeo, uh, where we get the word cosmetics, and that we would bring beauty to the word of God by how we carry out uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I just thought it was so amazing. And so we've seen uh, the way that we talked a little bit at the end there as the chapter closed about the redeeming um, of Jesus Christ, how he redeemed them. And we talked a little bit about somebody who was taking, collecting aluminum cans and taking them to the redemption center. And I love what Marvin said. He said that if you were going to redeem something, you had to own it. And this is the thing. When Jesus, when he went to the cross and he redeemed us, it's because he owns us. We give our, he gives our lives. And God has given that relationship with us that if we give our lives to Christ, that he would redeem us, that he would save us from the life. And so um, this is where the chapter kind of ended. We're going to pick it up here in verse 1 of chapter 3. And we'll see what the Lord has for us tonight. So here in verse 3, verse, uh, well, let me go ahead and um, read all the way through the chapter and then we'll go back. So it says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil, evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceivers, deceiving various lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want, you, I want to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man af after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. When I sent Artemis to you, 
or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenith, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. So we're going to go back to chapter 1, uh, verse 1. And so here we go. Uh, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. One of the things here is that we see is the qualifications. We remember as we studied through um, First Titus, we were in First Titus uh, verse 16, that it talked about the people that were disqualified for good works. And these people, um, I'll just read it here, and it said, They profess to know God, um, but in works they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. But we see here by, um, it says to being subject to rulers and authorities, um, that we are ready for every good work. And so one of the things the Bible talks about here, um, and this comes from Romans 13, and I'm sure that you're very familiar with it, especially since we've been going through an election recently. Um, and one of the things that uh, Romans 13 said, it says, let every soul um, be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authority that exists are appointed by God. You see, the only time that we are to go against um, the governing authorities is when it goes against the word of God. And we see that I know that many of us, as we come here tonight and we start to think about the things in the election and the things that are going on in our country, um, I think oftentimes we wonder, is God seeing what's going on? God is in control of all things, and he knows exactly what's going on. But he is working in and through this. Uh, and we learn this. We don't have to go too far to learn this from the scripture that's going on. Uh, but one of the things that, that we want to make sure that we're qualified, that we want to not disqualify ourselves, but be qualified uh, for every good work. And as we talked about these good works, these good works are the results of having a relationship with Christ. These are the results of having a relationship with Christ. And so here in verse 2, it says, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. You see, one of the reasons we should show a humility to all men is because the, if you really look at God's word, we've all sinned. Every single person in this world has sinned. We've all sinned. Uh, I wanted to, to take you um, to a, a verse um, it's Romans 5.12. It says, Therefore, just as though one man, sin, entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we are to um, be an example, and we are to um, love others, and we are to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility and all to all men. Uh, one of the examples, a great example that we have, and I'm just going to read something briefly here from, um, this comes from Luke um, chapter 10. And actually, uh, it's amazing how God's word is so powerful and it's constantly speaking to our hearts. Um, this parable, it came up um, this week and it actually came up last week. And I believe it was JJ, the one that spoke about it. Um, and this is, this is talking about um, the uh, commandment that we should put uh, before anything it says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself um, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees and it's interesting um, but what I love about it that this Pharisee says um, to Jesus it says uh, but him wanting to do justify himself uh, said to Jesus and who is my neighbor and so he wanted to justify who is my neighbor and, and I love his answer here, and I, and, I, and I kind of briefly went over it last week, but I wanted to read it. It said, then Jesus uh, answered and said, a certain man went down um, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that, uh, that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came 
and looked and, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, he, uh, when he departed, he took two denaries, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will come back and repay you. So which of these do you think uh, was his neighbor to him who fell amongst the thieves? And then the uh, Pharisee said, and he said, uh, he who showed mercy to him. And, J and Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. It's amazing. It, it's, I love the way that uh, Jesus referred to him, that he who sh uh, showed him mercy. Um, and, and I think that this is the reason uh, why the study tonight is so powerful, I believe, is because it's God is oftentimes speaking to us and he's speaking. He was speaking to this man. He was saying to telling this. Jesus was telling this Pharisee that this is how you can get into heaven. You don't have to follow all these rules and regulations. You can come and receive the mercy of the person that was standing right before him. And you can receive the mercy of Christ and be saved. But I just love the way that and we see that that love. And so this is who we are called to be. And so we are to be not speak evil of no man. So here in verse 3 it says, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. I don't know about you guys, but that list, as you go down that list, many of those things, um, I, I was many of those things, and I, I was going to write down, but it was just a little lengthy, um, of some of the other versions, uh, yeah, some of the other things that I was, I was, it was kind of lengthy also to it in one of the other uh, in the message version uh, when it's when it said there uh, the very first one is when we were ourselves were once foolish it said we ourselves were once stupid I said wow that's me right there that's me I was stupid without the Lord uh, but it's it's amazing to see um, that we walk in a world though and many times as we see these things uh, and we see this list um, that the Lord really spoke to me in and through this this week um, because I, I was thinking about, do I actually hear um, God's call? And this is what I, I want to share with you tonight. Do you, do each and every person in this room, do we hear God's call uh, for what we would have us do? And, and I think many times we get involved. And the reason why I'm bringing this, I think many times we get, uh, we rub elbows or we uh, hang out a lot of times with people, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and I think sometimes I, I myself, I will talk to myself personally, I lose touch. With the outside world and the, and the people who don't know Christ, and, and I think it's so important that we uh, that we would see um, the call that God has on our lives, um, and to to be around the people that are in the sinful world. We live in a sinful world. Uh, we don't need to go too far. And one of the things that really spoke to me tonight, but I, I'm going to read something out of a, a it's another example from Jesus, and this comes from Matthew nine nine. And it says, as Jesus passed on, on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat on the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, but go and learn what this means. And the Lord said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. And so we should have a heart, and, and this really spoke to me this week, that I should have a heart for the people that are lost. I know that I shared with you a couple of weeks ago that somebody came out uh, in front of my house and they stole my catalytic converter off of my car. And I, and I shared that with you. And we actually went through prayer time and we prayed for those people. But one of the things that I failed to leave out is a couple of weeks ago, a detective came to my house, knocked on the door. And as he knocked on the door, my wife opened it and he wanted to share some information um, that the people um, that actually had came and stolen it were part of a ring and they had actually gotten caught by some of the information they had received from us 
from the pictures and actually the neighbor actually took some really good pictures, got the license plate and got everything. And so when my wife called me and I was at work and she told me these things, I, the first thing I, I got to share with you guys, the first thing I thought in my heart, I said, good, justice has been served. But why is it, I was asking myself as I started studying this, why is it when somebody does something to us, we want justice? But when I stumble before the Lord, I want mercy. I want mercy. When if I do something, I want mercy. Hey, Mike. Go ahead. <clears throat> so, and when Paul says in verse 3 there um, that we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, you see, Paul, I think, was, I envision that he really was emphasized that because Paul is saying, yeah, I I was that way. Yes. I wanted justice for, yes. this, for these people that were going against God's law, the yes. Jews, yes. and not mercy. Not and, mercy. And, um, and then he follows that with what he says in 4 and 5 yes. <clears throat> with total grace. It's powerful because he spans. He doesn't, he's not saying that we shouldn't do good works. That's right, he's not. And he, he says it, it's not our good works. But we should be an example of what, what it is to be good. Right. It's that, not, the it's results, never good, right? That's right. The we results of, change. of being a believer, yes, yeah, of being so. a follower, yes. No, it's powerful, it's powerful. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. It's powerful. But one of the things, many, like I said, many of you are... Um, our business owners, and, and I don't, uh, you know, need to pick on you guys, but um, as I was going through some training here in the last uh, week, uh, one of the things is we have a training at work, and it's called Active Shooter uh, Training, and this is, uh, and this is to, uh, in, in response to an active uh, shooter coming into your workplace, um, and three of the things uh, that really stood out to me, um, the first one is run, hide, or fight. Right? These are the three things that they really list on there. If the, the intruder that comes in or the person that comes, if you're at a place where you can run and get away, you want to definitely do this. You want to run. Um, and then also if you're in a place where, where you can't get out or you don't know where the shooter's at, but you hear the shouts and they're close, you want to hide, right? You want to hide, maybe trying to find yourself a place to hide. Barricade yourself in. They talked a little bit about that. And then they say if there's no other option, if you're locked into a place, and then you're going to have to choose a weapon, right? You're going to have to choose something to try to fight. And this is interesting that this is actually in real life, in real life scenarios. We see this played out on the news all the time. But us as believers, what do we do when we have an active spiritual um, killer that's out there trying to kill souls each and every day? What do we do against them? Will we be like Jonah that run and hid? Will we be like Jonah who went 2,500 miles in the wrong direction when God called him to go to the Ninevites? And told him that there were a people that even though that they were an evil people, there were a people that he loved. And he wanted them to come to know Christ. Or will we be like young David? One of the things I wanted to, you to see in Jonah, you know, if you read the story of Jonah, and it's an amazing story. Uh, how that story got to be like a child fairy tale, I'll never know. Because it is a powerful, powerful book. But one of the things in Jonah, if you remember, that it said that when he caught that boat, that it said that he went down to Tarshish. Right? He went down to Tarshish. This is where he went. And then when he caught that boat, he went down to the dock to get the boat. Right, He went down there. And then when he went to the boat, he went down into the hull. And remember, he fell asleep. And this is where they get him and they find out and they draw, um, they actually cast lots to find out it was him. Um, but we see that I think the Lord is pointing out in the book of Jonah that when we are running from God, we are going down. We are going down when we are running is one of the things that the Lord is really pointing out, the, one of those things that we are going out. But will we be um, a spiritual fighter like David, young David, who we saw that was so young that he was too young to wear battle armor. The battle armor would not fit him, right? We remember that, that the battle armor wouldn't fit him. And not only that, though, that one of the things that he was too young to even be on the battlefield. We remember that his father sent him there to take food to his brothers. And he was too young to go to the battlefield. But we see as soon as David saw his enemy, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistines who dare defies the armies of the living God? And we see that it's powerful that David trusted and he believed in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's so powerful for us to see that a young person, as young as he was, and, and I think I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago, that in the reality, in the story, 
And then this is the reason why I'm sharing this with you is us as believers, just like David, he was the giant in the story because we have God on our side. We are the giants, right? Don't we, we shouldn't uh, be pushed around by the enemy. We are the giants because we have God on our side. And so I think it's powerful that we see those things. Um, but as we, um, we see those things, I, one of the things that I see today that we hear a lot about, will we be first responders? in the world that is a sinful world? Will we be people that will go out and share the gospel of Christ with others? Will we be those people? It's a question tonight. And so here in verse four, it says, um, but when the kindness and the love of God, our savior toward man appeared, Romans 2, 4 said, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Many times, like I said, I shared with you guys where I grew up um, and where I went to church. Um, and when I came to know that God loved me, that Jesus Christ loved me with all my sins and all the things that I had going on in my life, that Jesus Christ loved me, it was freeing. Like you said, though, it is the goodness of God because I grew up in a, in a, in a, in a religion that told me that God hated me. He hated me because I could never walk the line. I could never toe the line. And even when I did good works, it never was good enough. It never was good enough to get me to heaven. And I knew that because my bad outweighed my good. Way outweighed it. Way outweighed it. And, and those are the things that I was doing on the surface that nobody knew about the things that I was doing in the background, right? Nobody knew what I was doing in secret. Only the Lord. But as, I just love that, that it's the kindness and the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. So here in verse 5, it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing and regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We talked about it tonight. It's not by works of righteousness. Um, it says works do not save us. Um, his mercy, he saved us, right? Mercy, not getting what we deserve. Salvation is a gift, right? Romans 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If we are in Christ, we are a new creation. All the old things have passed away. And so we see that those works are not of righteousness, not unto salvation, but we see according to his mercy. And God loves to extend mercy to us. You know, we serve a God and we go back to the Old Testament and we go to the, the Ark of the Covenant Pastor Ed talks about this all the time, and I just love a God that we serve, that the seat that he had before um, sinners would come, it was called the mercy seat, right? That people would come and the atonement for their sins, that we serve a God that has a mercy seat. Mercy uh, for each and every one of us. And I don't know about you guys, but I just love God's mercy. God's mercy is powerful. So here in uh, verse, um, are we in verse six? I'm sorry. Six. Six, yes. I'm sorry. Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, he poured out the Holy Spirit. When we were born again, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. The same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells and lives in each and every one of us. That's Romans 8.11. The reason why I share this with you tonight is I think that as we talked about earlier about the fight that we have in us that we are um, the giants. We are the giants. We have Christ on our side. And we should, if we um, prepare, um, and we talked about being first responders. You know, one of the things that makes first responders so powerful is when they, they are always anticipating what's ahead and they're always in training, right? We have many people here tonight are firemen or been served and those kind of, and they, they, they're used to every day they are in training anticipating what's coming and our training um, anticipating what is out there in a sinful world where we gather our power from is right here this is the sword the living word of god and, and this is where it is where to gather our strength from so here in verse 7 it says that having been justified by his grace we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life Justified. I, I love the way that Pastor Ed explained to me justified. When I heard justification, 
I said, wow, that's a huge word. I, I don't know how I can explain or even what it is. But what it means is just like I never sinned. Just like I never sins. When we come before the Lord and he gives us, we are justified as we surrender our lives to Christ and we accept his gift of grace and of love that we become justified just like I never sinned. It's so amazing. It's powerful um, that those are the things that the Lord gives us. It is a gift from God. We will give our lives and serve him and confess we confess he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? This is uh, 1 John 1, 9, and many people call this the Christian bar of soap, right? The Christian bar of soap, right? 1 John 1, 9. Hey, Mike. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chris. There's, sure. a, there's a reference in my Bible here um, in this section that's really beautiful also. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any, we're all creatures of Christ. If we, if we, uh, if we're not atheists, we know we're creatures. Yes. We're creatures of, yes. of uh, God who created us. But in seventeen it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. The old, all things have become new. New, a fresh start. Yes. And that's that is so yes. awesome. Yes. Think about it. Yeah, it's when we think about that we can, it's almost like a, a reset button. Yeah. Yeah, a reset yeah, button that all the things, um, and you know, as we as in our human relationships, I think this is where we, 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 we mess up with our relationship with God. Because I think when we have a human relationship with somebody and we do things in the past, and even though that we ask them for forgiveness and they forgive us, our relationship becomes tarnished. They don't look at us in the same light. But the thing that the Lord looks at us, if he looks at us, there is nothing that we can do that the Lord would love us any less. And well, he looks at us the same way. Yeah. Like old broken down hot rods that right. uh, got a new coat of paint yes. and, uh, and, a, and a new engine. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. We hard. have been made new. And yeah. another, another thing is that, um, you know, Ed talked about the definition of hope uh, with respect to, you know, uh, Christ's promises to us. And so we think about hope like, well, I, I hope to be able to make it to the next car show. Like, mm -hmm. well, maybe yes. that will happen. Um, hope in this context is certainty. Certain words. A is, living hope. A, yes. Yes. Right. A it's living hope. It's a certainty. Certainty. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here, are the second half of, of verse seven, um, when he speaks about errors, you know, back when uh, kings, um, back in those days, if you were a, a, a relative or if you're a kinsman, they said, or if you're a relative, um, this is how you became heir to the throne. But the thing that's so amazing about Jesus Christ is when we accept Christ, that he adopts us into his. And this is how we become heirs of eternal life, that he adopts us into his family. And we have heirs. Um, and so it's amazing. It's powerful, I thought, to see. Um, and that comes from Ephesians 1.5, um, that we are adopted into his family. Um, and he just loves sharing, uh, loving us and loving on us. So here on verse 8, it says, and This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works, that these things are good and profitable to all men. And you see that we are to, as Chris pointed out, we are to be doing good works um, because that is the result of us being a followers of Christ. Um, but remember that, uh, that they would, uh, I wrote something here down about this particular verse. It said, let your light so shine before men that they would, um, glorify your Father in heaven, Matthew five sixteen. Uh, but this is powerful, even more powerful than you really think about it. And because many of us, I don't know about you guys, but many of us, if people that knew me and knew when I grew up, um, and if they see some of my walk, and I'm a long way from being where the Lord wants me to be, but they can admit that there must be a God. If Mike Ramirez can walk in even that close to the Lord, there has to be a God. <laughs> There has to be a God. There has to be. And, and I think it's, this is the reason why the Lord uses people who are flawed. He uses us that are flawed uh, because he sees that we have a need and he sees that it, the weaker things of the world. And like I told you that before in, in a past study, that when I heard that God uses the weaker things of the world, I said, hey, Lord, that's me. That's me, Lord. Use me. It's a powerful prayer, but the Lord will use us. One of the things that I've talked about this verse here, but will we yield as he calls us to do those things, as he calls us here, 
um, that those who had believed that he would call to maintain good works, uh, would we yield to his call of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to a sinful world and be a first responder? Remember, we talked a little bit about the training um, that constantly that they're in, that we must be in God's word constantly to until he returns. This is what our call is, to be in God's word constantly and sharing the gospel. And when I speak to many of you tonight, I think many of you think that I want everybody to go and knock on somebody's door and say, hey, you know, Jesus Christ loves you. Um, and I think that that's what I love so much about Paul here is that he's telling Titus, he said, it's by your example of how you live your life. And, and I love about, that's what I love about this. This is what Pastor Ed, he said, you know, all of you go out there, live it, live it in front of everybody. And we've talked about this also, that the outside world, believe it or not, they're watching. Your neighbors, if anybody knows, people at work, people that you interact with, even people that are relatives who are not believers, they're watching your life. They're watching the way you walk. And then the thing that's so powerful is when there is a death in the family or something happens and how we act in that. Yes, we, we, are, we are hurt by these things, but we know that we have that peace, that inner peace that surpasses all understanding. And people can see that and they say, how am I so broken and how is this person even holding up when that person was his brother or more close to relatives? I'm just a friend. I only work with him and I'm broken. And they start to see the hope of Jesus Christ, that living hope, that certainty that we have in our hearts, knowing that we are going to be eternally with Jesus in heaven. And this is what they see. And so it's powerful, that witness. But it's powerful for us to be first responders. But here in verse 9, it says that we are to, but to avoid foolish disputes genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. You see, we are called um, to not to be argue uh, people into the kingdom, not to beat them over the head with the... But if we so love Jesus Christ so much, if we live it out before people, that they would see it, we wouldn't have any need to go to people and try to force uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ down their throats. They will see it. And so Paul is telling Titus here that you are not to call people to argue and argue them into heaven. This is not what you're called to do. What's interesting, one of the things that he talks about here is genealogies. Um, one of the things that I, it reminds me of it, it genealogies is like there's, um, you know, the, the Latter-day Saints, the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that we've talked about. That oftentimes the genealogies, that they oftentimes, if you don't know this, that they actually, family members, they'll say, hey, did you know my uncle? And did you know somebody? I said, yeah, we work together. Do you have any old pictures of them? They'll ask you, do you have any old pictures of them? Do you have a yearbook picture of them? And they want these yearbook pictures, and they want these pictures so they can go back. And they believe that they can ask for forgiveness for sins for a person that's already gone. But, you know, when you corner them and you ask them about this, where does this say this in God's word? It isn't in there. And so these are the things that he's telling him. Don't get into disputes about these things that have no bearing on your salvation. Don't get, any, and, and don't get into arguments about them. It's not that important. It's not that important. It's unprofitable, it says there, and it is useless. And he tells us to avoid these people. I wonder if that could also have something to do with somebody that could think that they're a Christian because their mother was or their Mm -hmm. grandmother no, you're absolutely yeah yeah no you're you're, you're absolutely right marvin because I, I know so many people um and like, like i said i grew up in the catholic religion and and a lot of times people and, and i'll tell you the truth about myself and i'm only speaking for myself that i defended the catholic religion to my death only because it was my mother's religion and my grandmother's religion and her grandmother's religion but did i know was i serving in that capacity was i was i walking in the walk absolutely not did i know any of the scriptures did i know anything that they did i know anything about catechism i knew absolutely nothing but i defended it to death only because it was traditional and i felt like i was letting my family down and, and yeah you're right traditionally but there is many christians that speak about that that and but this is the thing that's different about christianity you have to accept christ even though you grew up in a christian home there has to come a time that you receive christ in your heart that you receive christ and you say and you make a you know confession that you want and to serve the Lord. Been, he may have been also referring to the fact that you know there were you know getting back to you know stick to the word here yes. is that you know some sects were saying you have to first become a Jew before Jew. you can mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. yes. a follower of Christ. Christ. Yes, and he's saying no, no, you, you don't have to do that. That's right. You could right. also extend the genealogies to. For example, the Samaritan woman, right? She came from a certain genealogy, yes. and there was a great division. 
Yes. You know, one didn't talk to the other. Yes. It's really, it's, what is it like today? It's race. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Yes. As if God cares what race we are. Mm-hmm. He doesn't even see it. No. <clears throat> and, and, but here Satan has taken, brought this country to its knees over what Jesus really says. These are useless issues. That's right. I don't look at that, yeah. you know. And, and this gets back to what Willie would say is God calls us to be witnesses and not attorneys. Yes. So, and not, you know, argue, you know, try to argue uh, them into salvation. Oh, yes. So, you know, and it's interesting in God's word, you know, he says that there is neither Jew nor Gentile nor, nor male or female. Uh, and he says that we're all one in Christ. And so, it, you know, before Christ, we, there is the human race. That's the only race there is. There is right. the human race. Right. He doesn't. He doesn't see us in any other light. He sees us in I the think, human race. I think that says it all. We are all one in Christ. We are one in Christ. And Amen. the Pharisees were putting their trust in the fact that they were children of Abraham. Ham, right? yes, yes. And said, "Yeah, well, I can. <laughs> yes. I can create children of Abraham out of these rocks here. He was a rocket, yes. as. And what's so amazing about this is, as you pointed out, is that it is Paul speaking, the Pharisee of Pharisees. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. This, he, like, this, this was is, really great. Yes, this yeah. is what's great. He's the one speaking about Paul speaking about. He had credentials. He had credentials. Yeah. That's yeah. right. We would say today he has clout, right? Yeah. He had clout, right? <laughs> he had clout. So, all right. So here in verse uh, ten, it says, um, "But reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition." admonition. And so it's speaking here to reject a device man, and it's, it's interesting. It calls him a divisive man. That these are people. These are people that come in and they want to divide. Um, that the false doctrine that they bring, um, that they will, uh, we should warn them. And it says that we should warn them once or twice. And we talked a little bit about this. There was, I believe, it was Dirk that came, and he was interesting. That we were talking about this, and we shared that with him. That oftentimes that people come and they share a false gospel. Uh, what we should do, though, is lovingly, we try to share the true gospel of Jesus Christ in a loving manner. We try to share, not argue, not dispute it with them. We want to give them a loving manner, but we want to give them a couple of opportunities. Um, but as he said after that, we should reject this person. We should reject them. And it doesn't mean that, you know, we don't ever want to talk to them again, but we want them to under, come to understand the truth of the gospel. But after that, we can't, you know, spend the rest of our time disputing about what they believe and what we believe. And so... We want to give them a couple of opportunities in God's word, it says here, but we also, we want to reject them after that. That here in verse 11, I think it clarifies a little bit more. It says, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Warped, I wrote here, is a person who remains off track. Um, One of the things that I see here that this person is also being self-condemned. And this is the free will uh, that we talk about in Jesus Christ, that we have a free will to accept his gift of, a gift of grace, but that free will also to reject it. And this is what the Lord is speaking of here, that he can reject the gospel. But it's interesting to me to see that Jesus came and he um, died so that we would not be, uh, that we would not be separated from Christ um, and that we would reject that. It's just, it's so hard for me to think that he did everything for us, that all we have to do is belief and what he's, his word says. And there's so many things that in the Bible that are so true and the, and the promises of God are so true. It's amazing to me that, that people can um, go without Christ. It's just power. It's just, I just don't understand it. But uh, for somehow, some way, there's people who don't know or don't want to accept the gift of God. And, and, and I think that uh, in the book of John, he speaks about that men, the reason why I believe is because men love the darkness. And, and I, when I was living in darkness, uh, Many times that people would tell me, you need the light, you need, you need help, brother. And I said, I'm living a good life because I love the darkness. That's what, at that time, I loved the darkness. And that's what it was. I was trying to stay in the darkness. But thank the Lord, somebody had the, the, the patience to share the love of Christ with me. So here in verse 12, it says, um, When I send uh, Artemis to you or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. For I have decided to spend the winter there. So this is uh, Paul. And they, they believe that the commentators believe that he is actually calling Artemis or Tychicus to come and to relieve Titus um, there in the island of Crete where he's at. Um, and so we see that uh, Paul is calling um, Titus away from Crete. And so he wasn't supposed to stay there. Um, we actually learned something um, because we remember that um, the letter 
that was written after um, after this that we remember that in 2 Timothy 4.12, when 2 Timothy was written much later in this letter, that Tychicus uh, went to Ephesus. And so they do believe that it was Artemis that went to um, Crete to take over for um, Titus. And this is uh, the reason. And Nicopolis, at this particular time, there is actually seven cities that are called Nicopolis. Uh, but many commentators believe that it is a western city in Greece there, um, that the, this Nicopolis that he's talking about. So it says here at 13, it says, uh, Send Zenos, uh, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And so we see as we send out missionaries, first of all, that we want to make sure that they send out, we send out missionaries that have everything that they need. Uh, but it's interesting here that this Zenos, uh, he's not really mentioned anywhere uh, in the Bible, but I, I love the way it points out that he's a lawyer. Um, and, and I, when I was, uh, well, some of the commentators, I love that they had a comment about him. That maybe this was possibly Paul's way of sending people. Remember, they to them, they was all about the law and how they got into heaven. And so it's interesting to see that maybe he got a lawyer to try to explain the law. This is a man that knows the law. And he can tell you that the law is not going to save you. And so they, some of the commentators, I thought that was interesting, that they thought that maybe that had something to do with it. Go ahead, Chris. You know what I like, too, about this verse is, is here, you know, so many people doubt the authenticity of of the scriptures but when i see like little this is like housekeeping yes mm -hmm. yeah he is teaching us one of the, some of the deepest things yes and that, but you know i'm getting to the end of my letter here yes and i'm gonna I'm take care of a little housekeeping you know to me it just screams authentic authenticity for for the words of the book like yes because yes. if somebody just wrote this that's right they wouldn't do that. That's right. You know, and, and then not only that, though, we think of the people that they write about, and we talk about Zenos wasn't mentioned here, but Apollos. We remember Apollos the last time that we were in Acts chapter eighteen together. Paul and Apollos. Yeah, yeah, Apollos. That he actually yeah. preached, and remember with Aquila and Priscilla that he actually preached, and they said he had an incomplete gospel. Remember, they said that his gospel is incomplete because he was a disciple of John the Baptist. And he just didn't know the whole Jesus Christ. And so remember Aquila and uh, Priscilla, they kind of took him aside and they told him the complete gospel. What, uh, okay, Zenus, if he's uh, he's a, a Roman jurist or whatever he is, yes. what are the odds that he is an expert in Jewish law? Uh, yeah, I know, yes, yeah, I know. I don't, yes, that's good, yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Um, amazing, uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, it, but I think it's interesting that he points him out, that, that like, like Chris was pointing out, it's interesting that he points out his profession. It points it out here, yes, right, that he's a lawyer. Yeah, well, profession. they did on almost all of them, the fisherman and the, mm -hmm. uh, the different trades. Yes. For some reason or other, that's, that's him. who you were. Yeah. And, and that kind of carried on over to, to us even today. It doesn't it seem like when we meet somebody, um, we say, hi, my name is Mike, and then most of the next question out of their mouth is, what do you do? What do you do? Right? Isn't that what do you do? Right? And that's the today. What Especially with men. Especially with men. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So yeah, I think it's powerful. Oh, what kind of car is there? Oh, what yeah, kind yeah, of car yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're always looking for like if we see, yeah. see a sticker on there, or we yeah. see something that kind of T-shirt they wear, uh, and if you, if you look and see a uh, um, if they if they see how uh, maybe a, possibly have a Ford sticker or something, then you know they're you know they're definitely a mechanic. You know they definitely need to work on something. So is it a Ford? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. So here in verse 14, it says, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. And so when I read this verse, I, I was thinking, do we hear the call uh, of God speaking um, to us to go out to a world that so desperately needs here, the urgent needs, that we would... Mm -hmm. um, share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. We see that the world we live in today um, is not a playground. And, and I think oftentimes myself, I, I grew up thinking, uh, you know, isn't that old saying uh, says, uh, uh, he who dies with the most toys wins? Isn't that what it says? Hmm. But it's interesting that, that this world is not a playground. And I believe that our playground, or I don't know if it's a playground, but a fun place will be is when we get to the Lord and be in heaven. Uh, but this place, earth where we're at, it is a battleground. And we are calling, the Lord, I believe, is calling each and every one of us um, to the battleground that we would go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, as we have been studying and we've been going through um, the letters here, we see that in Thessalonians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, we talked about the Lord's return. And we know God's promises are true. And, 
And oftentimes I say this, and a lot of times people will come up and ask me after, do you really, do you really, do you see something in God's word that says that God's coming? Uh, I see it in print, just like you printed. He promised that he would return, he will return. And I know one thing's for sure, it's closer today than it was yesterday. Absolutely. And so we know that the Lord is going to return. And so we have got to yell it from the rooftops um, in a kind, loving way to the world <coughs> who desperately needs the love of Jesus Christ because he is coming. And we know that his word tells us that when he comes again, that he will come to judge the world. He will come to judge the world. And so we, we need to understand that and we need to be anticipating um, his return. And so we should be constantly sharing the love of Christ with others. I think there's a lesson here that uh, would fit our world today to meet urgent needs. Urgent needs. We have a, a situation where we're providing yes. everything that people need. Yes. When if we should only be providing what they urgent need and force them to do to work. Sure. And yes. We're making a, a big mistake. I yes. Think. Yes. You know, one of the. Go ahead, Chuck. I'm sorry. I think what a lot of people, you know, they say, well, you know, they've been saying the Lord's going to come ever since, you know, the kid or whatever. But maybe the Lord's not going to come soon. But the thing is, are we going to make it till tomorrow? Yes. We yes. might need to we might need the Lord tonight. Yes. Look at Absolutely. Tim. Tim didn't know. Yes. You know? That's and, uh, yes. So just because the Lord's not coming soon doesn't mean we're going to see tomorrow. Yes. Right? Yeah. There's, Lord, you know? there's no one in this room that's promised tomorrow. No one. Absolutely. And so, yeah. But uh, I think the most important for us as believers is we know where we're going as believers. We know that, that we have a promise of eternal hope to be with Jesus Christ. Uh, and so, but we need to go and, and we can't just, you know, I think that a lot of times I, I kind of get caught up in my world and say, well, yeah, I, I know the Lord. And so, but I need to go out and I need to share the love of gospel, the gospel with others. Um, and especially, uh, and I have many people in my family. It doesn't, I don't need to go too far. And as I was sharing with you, I think one of the things that really spoke to me this week is when the people came and they stole the catalytic converter. And Pastor Ed said this week, as he closed uh, this week, he said, everything that happens is God filtered. Everything that happens to us is God filters. And I've always believed that. But one of the things that I think the Lord was speaking to me, and this is the reason why I was bringing this up tonight, is when they took my catalytic converter, I believe it was the Lord telling me, Mike, you don't have to go too far to share the gospel. The people are coming to your front door. They're stealing, they're stealing something off your catalytic converter. They're coming to your front door. You don't need to go to faraway countries. You don't need to go to other places. They're right here. We're in the place. We're, it's like you're in the middle of the ocean, Mike. You're in the middle of the ocean. You don't see all the water. See the water, see it. And this is the thing that I think the Lord is trying to point out. So here in verse 15, it says, And all who are uh, who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. So I love the way Paul always closes, and this is uh, typical of his uh, closing, uh, that he closes in grace. Um, and so one of the things that I always love remembering about grace is that it is God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, but it's the love of a man who came to understand grace. One of the things I'll close with tonight is a, a story, and, and I think it's fitting um, that it'll go together tonight with, uh, as I close tonight. And so there was this um, dangerous uh, sea coast um, where ships, uh, where, where shipwrecks would often occur. And there was a little life-saving station. It was very primitive. It was a little hut. Um, right? It was a little hut that they had. Um, and this building, um, they only had one boat. Uh, the members were committed um, and unselfishly met out uh, day and night uh, to save the lost who were shipwrecked. This was their call that they would go out to save people who were shipwrecked. Um, and so this little uh, life-saving station became famous and many people wanted to um, wanted to be associated with this little life-saving station. They wanted to be associated with. So what they did is they said, hey, we want to be part of it and said, hey, we'll make uh, donations um, with money and we'll donate our time. Um, and we'll actually, um, you know, if there's anything that you need, we'll, we'll be part of this little uh, life-saving station. And so they allowed them to come and, and to volunteer and the life, they envisioned that the life-saving station would get bigger um, and so one of the things, the very first things that they came about is this, um, they became a committee. And the first things they did, they said, hey, this, it's, uh, we should make the life-saving station much nicer. Uh, and so we should upgrade it instead of being very primitive and having only, uh, you know, a little hut with a few little cots, we should upgrade it. And so 
they went ahead and they had enough uh, money to actually do this. And so that, this is what they did. They make the little uh, station much nicer. And so they, they made the station, they got rid of the cots and they removed the cots and they actually got new beds for, for the life-saving station. And they actually went out and bought two brand new uh, boats that they bought, the vessels that they went out to go actually rescue these people. And they bought it extravagant. And they actually made the club or the actual, the uh, life-saving station, they made it much bigger. Uh, but what's interesting about it is once they made this life-saving station much bigger, um, that they went around and the people, they, they started gathering and they started becoming like a gathering place that the people would come and gather at this little life-saving station. And it became kind of more like a club, like a, like a club that they would actually come to. But one of the things that's interesting is that a lot of the people that were in the club started losing interest to actually going out and to actually go on these calls that they would have to go out to, to rescue people that were called. So what they did is in this committee, they came out with, uh, they agreed to actually hire a, a company, a lifeboat company to go out and to bring them back because they no longer, even though they had new boats, they didn't no longer have a drive to go out because things were too comfortable there in their new life-saving station. And so what they did is they actually, um, they made new cots and they made this place beautiful and they hired this new crew. Well, one day there was a huge uh, 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 ship that uh, had a, a call out that it was actually sinking. And so they sent these new, uh, these new uh, people out to go gather them. And so as they did, they went and gathered them. They brought the people back and these people, well, there was a ship was a huge, like a cruise liner. And so many of these people had said they came in, they were dirty, they were filthy and they brought them all back to this new life station station that was just newly remodeled and so they brought all these people back and they totally destroyed or wrecked the uh, the the whole new life saving station that place was just destroyed but not soon after that the people finally cleared out and they finally left um, the committee they made a, another emergency meeting and what they did immediately is they had showers built on the outside that people could clean up the next time that they brought them before they were actually come into the building because their life-saving station that they had just newly remodeled had gotten destroyed. And it wasn't too much long after that in the next committee meeting that they had decided that somebody had put on the board that they wanted to eliminate their life-saving station going out at all trying to save. And they said, we want to suspend that and no longer go out. But some of the members said, but this is what we're founded on. This is what we do. We are a life-saving station. This is what we're called to do. But they got outvoted. And we see that that life-saving station became more of a club. And they told those members who wanted to continue the life-saving station, they told those members to go out and to start their own life-saving station. And so those members, this is exactly what they did. They went out and they started their own life-saving station but it wasn't too much longer after that that the same problems that they had at that one started happening in that and happened started happening in their life saving station. And so in this part of the uh, world, in this uh, little area there, there is many life saving station slash clubs today, and there are many shipwrecks that still in those waters every single day. But one of the things that those people that are shipwrecked today often drown because we see that those people that are had that heart for going out and saving the lost no longer have a desire because life is too comfortable. And so as we close tonight, we're gonna ask our Lord to, um, to bless us tonight. So Father God, as we close tonight, Father, we pray, Father God, that you would give us a desire and a heart, Father, to always go out, Lord, and to seek people, Father, who don't know you. Help us, Lord, not to be comfortable, not to be too comfortable with this life, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would um, give us a heart, Father, to go out to this world, Father, so, that so desperately needs you. Help us not to take it lightly, Father. Help each and every person here tonight, Father. We pray that you would um, use each and every person tonight, Lord, that you would um, help us to go out into a world. We love you, Father, and we pray all of these things tonight, Father, and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.